Evening everybody, thanks for tuning in, welcome to the Rangers Journal Podcast, I'm your host tonight, Scotty, and I'm delighted to be joined by, well, there's a wee bit of handsomeness, handsomeness and a wee bit of wisdom in the panel tonight, so it uh, should be a good pod, we're going to dissect the Motherwell performance at the weekend, um, probably rather quickly because it's a bit already getting beat off a of Motherwell at home, um, then Ross is going to take control for a wee while, go over some certain aspects within his squad and bits, of, bits and bobs from a play and then we'll wrap up with a quick Benfica preview. If you haven't seen the work that Ross done on the Benfica interview with the long foot, the long long ball podcast, wasn't it, Ross? Long ball football podcast. Yeah, Barney long and uh, Albert, really nice lads. Yeah, check definitely that out. Definitely go over, definitely go over and get a wee check, lads. Right, so um, just we'll get rid of the panel first. Get overall thoughts on on the match on Saturday, Tom. I'm going to come to you first. Um, what did you think of the game on Saturday? Yeah, for a dull evening, Scott evening, gents. Um, yeah, obviously the result is disappointing. Um, I just felt there was something missing there that, that we haven't been missing the last few weeks. I can't sort of put my finger on what that was. I think the tone was set in the first 10 minutes or so when Motherwell came out and pressed us, kept us in our own sort of like in our own half. We couldn't get out. We couldn't get the ball played. And then we get the early goal where, you know, you've got to say it's a mistake from Suter. Don't know what he's doing. Um, and they've then got something to cling on to and we're then having to chase the game. Um, I was still encouraged that we made chances, but we just didn't take them. The goalkeeper made some good saves. The defence played well, but um, it was just a bad day at the office. And to be honest, in a in a title race, you're going to get those. Not everything's going to be perfect, and it's how we how we bounce back from this now. See what the mentality of the team and the squad is like. Definitely, definitely, Ross. I'm going to come to you next. In the pre-match press, I struck Kettlewell, the Motherwell manager. In me, I, I watched. I see. Well, I seen a clip of it, and I'm lying if I say I watched the whole thing. It came across kind of. He said we're playing the best team in the country just now. Came across kind of with a defeatist attitude. I would say. Um, and then his Motherwell team came out flying out of traps, didn't they? Do you think that maybe contributed to the complacency Rangers showed on Saturday? Yeah, look, I th- Scott Brown did it as well. Um, you know, it, it's quite a common technique, isn't it? Quite a common tactic that managers tend to do. You quite kind of under-promise, over-deliver always seems to be the way, you know. I think it kind of lulls you into a bit of a false sense of security, thinking they know that we're the best team. They know that we're going to, you know, walk all over them the whole game, have it our way, and then they come out and, and do what they did. Um, I don't know if we're talking through overall thoughts on the game at the minute, but I'll, I'll share what, what I kind of thought of the first half anyway. I think that, it, that this is probably the negative element of the rotational system and the rotational mm-hmm. style of play that Clement is, is bringing in. I think we look really disjointed, a bit leggy even, which was kind of odd, um, I, you know, given we've worked so hard on fitness. So, so you know, that'll no doubt be uh, picked up by the by the team. I think the challenge as well was when we were playing St. Johnson, yeah, we got out of jail arguably with a, a, a James Tavernier goal that stimulated us into action and got us playing the, the sort of way that we should be, urgent and pressing the ball forward and, and, and you know, really driving and, and consistently moving the ball forward. Uh, but we didn't really have those options at half time to, to change the game that much. Um, so Motherwell probably knew that, you know, they probably were in the back of their mind, they knew that we didn't have those levers to pull. Um, so, yeah, interested to hear what the other lads think. Billy, I, d- I don't know what your thoughts are on that. For me, I thought we actually played not too badly and created an awful lot of chances. And, and some of the, if you remember in the first half, uh, Silver, he literally could have put it anywhere else other than where he puts it and we would have been back on level terms before half time. Um, they were throwing themselves at everything, every every ball uh, towards goal. They were like last dish saves on the goal line. It was one of those, if you're a Motherwell fan, do they do that every week? With the other teams are playing or was it just because we're playing us I'd want to question that if it, that was the case but it was just really frustrating overall it was um, I felt we'd, in any other any normal game we, we win that by probably three I, I'd, I'd probably need to agree with you on that um, we'll, we'll go around and we'll talk about 
each area of the pitch, gents, right? We'll speak about I'll ask somebody about defence, somebody else in midfield, somebody else about forward line. Um, Tom, I'll come back to you. You touched upon Suter and Goldson at the back. Ridvan was at the back with Tavernier. That was kind of your normal back four for Rangers just now. Um, who is your thoughts overall on the centre back pair? And on um, Friday's point, I was actually sitting here talking to Bob and Kai and basically saying, Is John Suter going to the Euros? And he comes out and gives us a performance like that on Saturday. What was your thoughts on the defending overall? Um, <clears throat> I'll take Ridvan out of this because I thought he had a really good game um, on Saturday. But Suter and Goldson from pretty much the first minute didn't get to grips with uh, Big Bear up front for, for Motherwell and he, and he ragdolled them. Um, probably Goldson more than Suter. But um, it, it's... I think in commentary we said that was their seventh or eighth game in a row together. Um, and, and I would say it's probably the poorest they've both played as a partnership. The second goal, can you can you lay some blame on Tavernier for not being tighter to the to the guy? I, I think I can. a little bit. Yeah, yep. I, I think it'd be a little bit harsh the way we were because we were chasing the game. You know, we we're gonna be leaving space at the back. But um, I, I thought the, the centre-back pairing had a really off day and it, it was pretty concerning. I mean, there was one one point in the second half where Bear was left one-on-one -on -one with Goldson, goes by him. Goldson goes down holding his head. Yeah. don't know whether it was a foul or not, but he, he seemed very weak in that moment. And, you know, it's the SPL. These are the sort of strikers that we play against, big rough and tumble guys and... It should be the bread and butter, as I say. The, from the first goal, it sort of set the tone defensively wise. And uh, yeah, both of them are a lot better than what we showed on Saturday. Right, Ross, so I'll come to you on um, the midfield. We had um, Nico Raskin, John Lundstrom in the middle of the park. Um, we had Ross McCausland out on the left, I think it's fair to say. It depends yeah. whether you want to take your wingers into the sort of I would say they're middle to front, aren't they? So we'll, yeah. we'll touch upon sort of Dujo and Sterling. Like I've said in previous pods, I think Sterling's occupying an area of the pitch just now. I don't think Clement's asking him to play as an out and out right winger, which yeah. I think is fair to say. Um, what was your thoughts in the midfield, particularly when he called Raskin? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the one, isn't it? The one kind of key talking point, I would say Raskin was, I think, ineffective is, um, is probably not extreme enough to say. I think he was an empty shirt near enough in that first half. I think, um, well, look, let's compare it first half to the second half. We were a lot more effective in the second half, weren't we? Ball progression, moving the ball forward, mopping things up, keeping that momentum. When the secondary balls were coming, we were getting those and re, you know, re, reforming that attack, which yeah. just wasn't happening in the first half. Now, I, I don't think it's fair to say that Nico Raskin was the only player who was failing in that first half. And maybe he's the one that's probably going to get a bit of uh, you know, a blame for it. Um, but certainly he was one of the, the you know the key culprits where I, I feel like he's, it's, it's, it's his head's gone a little in terms of confidence. I think he's he doesn't want doesn't he doesn't demand the ball the way he used to. You know he mm. used to, and maybe it's the way we're set up. Maybe it's just not the, the team that Raskin's going to flourish in. Maybe that's just the way we have to accept that now. And yes, he's a high quality player in the right team, but maybe that's just not the way we're going to um, you know be able to get him involved at the minute. Um, so certainly he was a concern. I think. You know, Lundstrom was was quiet, um, to be fair. I thought Diamande was, he, I think that was his worst game he's had. And look, at, he's new here and he's getting used to the climate and the, whatever, all these different things that he needs to become a, accustomed to. Uh, but it was certainly his worst game in a range of shirts so far. I think he was gave the ball away cheaply, wanted far too much time on the ball. Um, and, and, you know, you're not going to get it when team, this is, this is, this is team's cup final. I know that's, I'm not trying to blow smoke up us here, but this is team's cup final coming to Ibrox playing in front of 50 odd thousand fans. And it's a, it's an opportunity to put them on the, on the map and, and, and have their name remembered by their fans for as, you know, for, for indefinitely. Um, so I thought Diamande was poor. I'll touch on the wingers, although, you know, I'll let Billy probably talk, talk, talk through that as more of a forward line, but Sterling again, very quiet. Pretty ineffective. Didn't really see much of Tavernier getting down that right wing and overlapping or providing much support. Um, maybe we'll go into a bit of detail about 
McCausland at some point, but um, it feels like the lad's kind of been thrown in a little bit too deep. I think in an ideal world where we had the strength in numbers to rest him a little bit more and allow others to take that strain of, of, of you know, first team consistent, first mm -hmm. team Rangers football, I think that would be better for him. Um, so I, I don't think it's entirely his fault. It's through necessity. But certainly he's he, he's off the boil at the minute. And um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a real challenging one. I think when things are going well, you look at the team and see him as a, what a great prospect. This lad's going to be a phenomenal player. Let's get him brought in and introduce him slowly into the team. But when things are going bad, I think it's he does stand out as a player who's quite ineffective and, and unable to really change things. And I think his kind of stature as well doesn't really help against these big burly defenders. Um, those would be my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, Raskin for me has not produced anything ever since he's come into a Rangers shirt, to be honest with you. Probably sounds a wee bit harsh to people in the comments, but I would like to know if anybody in the comments could tell me what Nico Raskin actually offers as a football player for Rangers Football Club. No, the boy is... He's came in and improved the midfield. It's been he signed last January, but the midfield moved up a level above Nico Raskin now. And... I mean, he's not, he's basically not doing it in a Rangers shot for me. He's had a good pre-season friendly against Newcastle at half time, and he's had a good second half against Savet away. That's all I've seen for that guy in a Rangers jersey. And for him to want this big money move that he spoke about in the press, I would say he needs to start doing, doing more of that. So that's my thoughts on Nico Raskin. Um, just, Barry, just on Scotty then, you, you, don't think that, you don't think that he's, he's shown previously that he, he's, he's at the level, he, well, you know, personally, I think there's a real good player in there. And I think he was brought in as a um, a Gattuso, you know, breaking up play, releasing the ball forward, good tank on him, can probably play alongside someone on our double pivot quite nicely, comfortable with the ball at his feet. Yeah, he doesn't really score, he doesn't really get forward, but he's quite a reserved player naturally. Do you not think he's shown that level? And, and I guess there's one for, for, for Billy Tomo as well. Do you not think he's shown glimpses that he can, he can step up? I think in a, there's been a couple of old firm games where he's played pretty well and 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 sort of um, the shirt hasn't weighed too heavy on him. Yeah, but there's been no... Nobody's beat Callum McGregor in an old firm game in the midfield yet. Nobody. Now, I know Callum McGregor plays a kind of six and we've put Cantwell on him and we've done this and we've done that. But ultimately, see when you've seen Scott Arfield sign for Rangers, that was the first central midfielder we signed since we got back into SPFL that could actually compete with Scott Brown for Celtic. He actually went man to man on him and showed him. He actually showed Scott Brown up for what it was. I mean, it was just, it was just a hard. Well, he thought he was a hard man on the pitch. Um, I'm going to end up with myself cut here. <laughs> I was but, just thinking the exact same. Uh, thing. I know, I know, I'm, I'm not going to muddy waters, isn't I? But it's, <sighs> Amy Raskin's not done it, Ross, and he needs to produce more to to win get any team. I think having John Lundstrom beside him. In the midfield and Saturday's done him absolutely no help whatsoever because Lundstrom was playing more of the kind of forward role. He looked as if he was playing the eight in Saturday to me and Raskin was the one sitting. But then you had the big boy Bear up front who I'm going to probably seat Matt up after we finish this kind of chat. Um, there was, he was nowhere to be seen. Like, he, he didn't protect the uh, Goldson and Suter at all for me. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Billy, what mm. do you think? Uh, he's, I can't really disagree with you, Scott. He's he's not done anything this season really of note, um, bar half a half a, a half or something like that. Um, I loved him when he first came through. It does stick in my, I don't know what, you, what you'd call it, stick in my throat, whatever. But the that he thinks he's coming here for a stepping stone move to a bigger a bigger league. You need to be playing a lot better than he has this season to be saying stuff like that. So uh, yeah, I'm not not impressed by him. Um, don't think he was the right choice on Saturday. Mm. And um, yeah, he's not. He's not. I mean, you 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 hear that he's coming back from injury, but I mean, how long has that been? He's been coming back from injury for. He's he's not he's not done much this season. I know, I know. I would need to agree with that. So uh, we'll quickly touch upon this before we move on to the next part of the show. So this is our, our top stats for Saturday Rangers at seventy percent possession. They did an XG of three point seven win goals. Motherwell had one. Um, well, not point nine nine. Rangers 31 total shots, Motherwell had 15. Rangers had six big chances, five big chances missed. Um, 81% accurate passes, nine fouls committed to Motherwell's 10, three offsides to Motherwell's one, 15 corners to Motherwell's two. Um, Tomo, 
that doesn't show you what happened on Saturday, did it? I thought Motherwell deserved a victory, if I'm being brutally honest. No, I don't think it does. Um, I think Motherwell, as I say, I think they were brave. They started pressing us from early on in the game, pinned us back. And then even when we got it back to 1-1, I thought, right, we're going to kick on here now, get a second, get a third. But they were the ones that looked likely to score. They, um, Like I say, they were brave against us. They were taking chances. They weren't just sitting back and hanging on for a 1-0 win or a 1-1 draw. Um, as I say, the guy up front, you've got the heat map there for him. I thought he was excellent. He led that, that, that line brilliantly. Gave Suter and Goldson absolute nightmares. Took his goal well. Um, but I think it's the first time in a, in a long time, especially at Ibrox, we've had a team come out at us, and we've had to we've had to try and answer that. And unfortunately, on Saturday we didn't. I mean that 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 um, the stats are the only one that's a concern. There's a big chance missed. Any any other game, you're thinking if you just showed us those stats without the big chances. Like, oh well, we must have stole that one, but it just it doesn't tell the story of what the what actually happened in the game because they I just think they 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 bullied us. Um, I mean, there's quite a lot of the industrial challenges as well, and quite a lot of the uh, dark arts being in, um, employed with free kicks or whatever. But they they did deserve to win. We didn't deserve to take anything from the game really. Ross, what's your thoughts? I I think this heat map's really good, and do you know what? I was really I was really impressed with the lead bear. I actually thought, thought he did a super I job. I thought he was really good. Um, I thought uh, that's the kind of player that you'd want in a um, European away game. You know, I know, I know. Maybe I'm taking this a little too far, but the, the style of play held the ball up brilliantly, caused a lot of issues up top, and was very comfortable with the ball at his feet. Um, I think the concerning thing is the, and we we touched on it a few weeks ago. Um, it's the amount of shots on target that we're getting without the conversion. Now, look, a lot of it was scrappy. A lot of it was in and around the box in the second half, six-yard box, probably one, two different shots in a, in a, in a phase of play. Um, so I think I think that that's a concern. Um, and, and there's no doubt in my mind that Clement will be slightly worried about that. Um, we'll probably come on to this in a little bit and, and some of the other players that we've got in that forward line and potentially some of the chances they should have scored. But he came out last night, I think it was, and he was on at the Armadillo and... Um, in Glasgow and said they had zero budget for January um, so we can be here and slate the players that we do have up front and, and the choices that have been made but, but certainly Clement's not the one to blame for that um, I think we are in a position where we're, we're heavily hit by injuries Danilo, Simmer, you know, two players that would potentially play as a nine um, Roof coming back in so so look, that, that, that conversion is probably based on the players that we've got at the minute I do think it's a worry, especially when we now go to big games like Benfica this week. We go to, you know, we've got the old firm coming up where the chances will be, a, a, you know, that there won't be 30, there won't be 30 shots. There'll be th five, you know, there'll be five. And, and, and our, you know, we need to make sure that our XG out of that five is at least two or three. So it's the conversion rate for me that's the concern, I'd say. Well, that brings me on, if I'm to my next point. Um Curry from a stands Ibrox has already been in. He and said 31 shots, zero goals. There's a problem. Now, I'm going to put it to you, gents, and say that Cyril Dessers is a big part of that problem. Um, he was playing against Motherwell on Saturday and offered next to nothing. Um, not for the first time this season. Then we had Lorne Shanklin to played against Celtic and scored against them. Um, you know, if you look at his heat map compared to Dessers. It does all, it kind of does all the talking now. Phil come on, said in his press conference in January that he likes his strikers to drop deep, but he likes them to link play up. I've no, Shanklin seems to have a reputation just for scoring goals now to me. I've watched him and he does an awful lot more. Um, Ross, I'm going to come to you first on it. Like, just our overall thoughts on the heat maps and like, have we made a mistake not signing Shanklin? Um, so, in response to your first question, the heat maps are contextual, right? So, we're looking at them as in, and, and there was a there was thing, I think I said it to you earlier, where it looked at the momentum throughout the game. It's basically yeah. a chart that shows momentum throughout the game, 
who's kind of got on the forefront in different patches of the game. 85% of the game, it was us. All right. So, so Dessa's naturally in the context of the game is going to be in those forward positions. He's in a nine position. He's dropped in a couple of times. The, and, and Shanklin naturally will have had to have come back in to feed off the scraps, to come back deeper, to try and retrieve the ball when we've got possession. So I think it's worth just outlining a context of mm-hmm. it, of the heat map. 100%. In, 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 res- in response to your second question about do, should we have signed Lawrence Shanklin, um, the, I would say yes, but I'm saying that through the eyes of a fan who wants to see Rangers convert in the chance that we're creating and Lawrence Shankland is a blue nose. He converts goals for fun. He would be a fantastic addition to the team and and seamlessly, you know, play within the, the, the team. I don't think anyone is going to disagree with that. Taking my Rangers fan hat off and look at it from a business and a, how do we actually get this player in? How do we make sure that we're utilising the funds that we've got in the best and most sustainable way? And that, that'll be the conversation that we'll have had internally, right? It won't have been, can this guy be add to our team because of course he could look he's, he's a phenomenal striker within a team that's that you know is probably overperforming for the quality of player they have so he 100 could have been a great addition to the team you then look at the other players that we've got we don't know behind the scenes what conversations have already been had about Seema, given that he was impressing given that he's now injured potentially those conversations may have taken a slightly different tangent and there may be a mutually agreed price you, we have no idea we've got danilo that we spent a lot of money on um, you know, Roof still on the books, who's one of the top three highest earners at the club. So R- Rangers, my, my Rangers um, heart, let's say, uh, says I would have loved to have had Shankland. He's a f- really great striker and completely potent in the box. Look, he scored two great goals. They should have stood at the weekend. One of them did. And that's, the, you know, that's the sort of player that would definitely benefit the club. But from a head point of view from a from a logical thinking point of view i just don't think we we were ever going to be able to fork out that unless there was a loan with a purchase option and the funds were brought forward from 2024 as as clement um said uh at the, the amadilla i definitely um for me can i take issue with something um ross i i, I can't quite put shanklin in phenomenal territory that um he's a good sbl striker and they would have Probably well, he would have been, certainly improved us, but it's it's the same. Um, unfortunately, we spent the money on Dessels. Who is that player profile? We're not really looking to make any money back on him. We hoped he would come in and score a lot of goals. We probably wouldn't, as a fan base, like Shankland back in the summer. Uh, it's only now that we see Dessels not really particularly working out. Although to be fair, I think that's his worst game since the old firm game. Uh, I think he's actually been fairly decent up until yesterday. Well, not yesterday, up until Saturday. Um, I, I think Shanklin would have probably been a better option, but I don't think I can call him phenomenal. Well, uh, well, look, okay. Well, <laughs> again, let's take it from a contextual point of view. Sure, Lawrence, Lawrence, Lawrence Shanklin, twenty goals for the season already, fifty-one percent shot accuracy, twenty-five percent goal conversion. That means that every shot he has of four, one of them is going in. So, so look, phenomenal is a, a word that yeah, you you would. There's maybe certain players in the world that you would call phenomenal within the context of the SPFL, and 85, 90 percent of our games are within that league. The, the the guy is exceeding what the you know the, the, the sort of median level is. So, so I would say he's 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 a very very skilled player in this environment. If not, you know, phenomenal maybe not the right word, but I, I see your point. <laughs> it just not, it just stuck out. He's, he's not going to set the world alight in Europe. Well, he maybe could, you know. Look, Chris Boyd was the same, you know. Chris Boyd, Kenny he Miller. Like he's got him. At the start of the season. He scored goals in Europe. He scored goals in he gave a conference league last season. Um, yeah. He's done it for me. He scored against everybody in the SPFL. What else does he the guy need to do? There was, there was talk that Cyril Dessers getting a, a move. 100%. He's, he's robust. And there was talk of Cyril Dessers getting a move in deadline day with Torino. And other clubs is interested, so I think if it's a straight swap for the two of them, it's it's a straight swap. I mean, it's as easy as that. You need players, proven players that are going to get your trading model taken over in a forward, a, a strong forward. I think he's going to play an awful lot for Scotland at the Euros as well because Scotland have not I've got to right, you're scoring goals just now. Tom, I'll come to you quickly on it, and then I'm going to hand over to Ross. Okay. Yeah, no, I think I'll bring it back to what Ross said and what Clement said last night. We didn't have any money to sign anyone in January. Now, 
back in back in the summer, <clears throat> hindsight's a great thing, but we spent the best part of 13, 14 million on attacking players on Dessers, Danilo and Lammers. At the time, was there too many complaints about that? I, I don't really recall it. And there wasn't, I don't think there's too many people saying, well, we should have got Lawrence Shankland. It's only as the season has progressed. You've got our oh, Shankland. And I think Shankland would do well in our team. He's, he's a proven goal scorer and he will get goals. Um, but, at the minute, there's just no money there to sign him, and Hearts would want a big fee. He is their star man, you know. He's not; go they're not going to let him go to anyone for less than what three million. I would, I would say, as a guess. So, as much as I think yes, he would be brilliant in our team. We've got what we've got at the moment, and that's what we've got for the rest of the season. Um, I agree with Billy. That was Desser's least effective game since probably the old firm. Um, hopefully, he will get back on that horse again and start getting some goals. But we need to start need to start supporting him. Um, I, I was watching it in the I was watching a, the game in the in the pub, and any time he does something wrong, there's a groan. Whether it's he miscontrols it, he's not quick enough to get away from a defender. We need to support him. He, he, between him and Silva, they're going to be our main strikers now until the end of the season. And that, that, that's what we've got. Yeah. And and, and I, think you're, I think you're right. Look, the hand's been dealt. We, we can't change that. Hence why maybe I've been a little bit more uh, pro Dessers than, than I should have been. You know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm willing, positive energy, serial Dessers. I'm trying to get him Never all get that energy and mind. support. That he can get, um, maybe maybe more than he probably deserves. There's still a player in there, which is so annoying, and I think we all have identified that there is someone that could be great. I think it's the composure. I think it's the clinical nature of him that you know is just a yeah. It's it's, he's an it's, it's strange, Ross, because some some of his finishes, and there's some that I'd forgot, are absolutely brilliant, brilliant yeah. finishes. You know, really took his takes his time, strokes the ball home, and other times it's just deer caught in a headlight and yeah i mean i don't think he's going to be our long-term future you know i don't think he's going to be our number nine next season but no. for this season i say we've got to support him as ross said that's a hand we've got dealt and we need to play it now wonderful thing all right ross on you go well before i do scott you mentioned now that we've got 30 odd people on it you mentioned at the start we've got um we've got handsome and 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 wise people on the Pod, so I thought maybe you could just elaborate on that very quickly, just just so that people can hear this and we can maybe get this clip or something. I don't know. You're actually you're actually want me to elaborate on it. No, 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 no. No comment. No, no, no. I'm joking. Bro. I'm joking. <laughs> don't worry. I wouldn't put you on the spot like that. No comment. Um, cool. Look, so so lads, and and I guess pe people in the comments, people watching, I'm really interested to get your thoughts on this. So it's someone that was raised raised a few weeks ago. Um, and something that I've kind of done a little bit of digging about and, and just kind of trying to understand the the, the, the kind of complexion. So the, the topic is corners and how Rangers uh, can effectively increase our goals from, from corners. So a few stats for you. So we're averaging 7.1 corners per game. Um, it's 8.6 when we're at home, 5.3, I think, when we're at away from home so that's the second and that's the second in the league if you can imagine a table of who gets the most corners and we're we're only conceding 3.34 against which is the second lowest in the league no prizes for guessing who's top of the league on that um i guess my my, my question is with ridvan yilmaz um very competent at getting the ball in borna barisic when he's playing extremely competent at getting the ball in james tavernier a set piece specialist what is it that we're doing wrong that means that our conversion rate is so poor? Because we mentioned the amount of shots we had on target, even just the amount of shots we had, 31 shots. We had an XG of three point something. What is it we're doing wrong that means that we're not converting from these corners? I think I'd put on the group after the game, because at the weekend we had 15 corners. And I said, well, what is it we're doing wrong here that means we aren't scoring from direct from a corner? When was the last time we scored? And I think someone said it was Seema 
um, had scored against the team, uh, for, for a header from a corner. So that tells you how long ago it was that we scored. I think we tried to calculate and it was almost 200 or something corners since Rangers had scored. Now, doing a bit of further, uh, sort of bit, bit of a deep dive into it, in the English Premier League, the last six winners of the Premier League have all scored, um, have had 20% or more of their goals from a set piece. So either a corner or a delivery put into the box. So 20% of their goals, so one in five goals has been scored from a delivery into the box and finished by a player. Um, Nicholas Jova, uh, who has come in at Arsenal, set piece specialist, I guess kind of behind the scenes guy who's, who's really into the detail on this and has various different techniques against various different teams on how they're set up. He came in, um, Arsenal were, in the 2021 season, They 10% of their goals were from corners, from set pieces, which was the third worst in the league. And they're now at 30% of their goals are coming from set pieces, which is 19, so that they're, they're, they're top of the league in that um, relation this year. So I guess, Tomo, I'll come to you first. What do you think we're doing wrong, uh, I guess, part one, and B, do you think Rangers should be looking to invest in, in a set-piece guru who can come in and adequately fix this problem? Well, I'll answer the second part first, Ross. Um, when we won the league under under Gerrard, I believe we had a, a set-piece coach employed. I don't know if that is the case now, but if we don't, then we should have it's such an important part of the game now and all these little details you know, add up. So if we haven't got someone in, we we really should. I mean, I'm personally a fan of the in-swinging corners, someone coming across. Joe Rebo used to do it brilliantly, cut mm. across the front post, either get a flick on or something in the back post. And the amount of times it would mostly be Morelos coming in at the yep. back post, you know. We Dortmund seem... away, wasn't it? Yeah. Dortmund away, yeah, but... post back in for... Yeah, and then there was, you know, there was one where um, when when Morelles scored at Celtic at Parkhead yep. again, flick on at the front post, Morelles coming round the back. But um, I'm a fan of the in swinging corners, but at the minute we just seem to just fling it in there and hope for the best. And to be fair, we win our fair share of cor corners in the air, but Goldson and Suter. Couldn't tell you the last time Goldson scored scored a header, but he wins so many, he should be sitting on seven or eight goals for the season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know if it's a case of just practice. Need to do a little bit more. Because like, like I say, we come up against big units and we've got some of our own big players, but maybe a bit of variation, keep teams guessing. But I think we just seem to be a little bit predictable. We just swing it in there. Every now and then we'll play a short corner and then it'll be swung in. But um, I'm more of a fan of the in-swinging corners rather than these out-swingers that we seem to have gone back to. Um, it, really, it really annoys me. And, and Billy, Rangers v Ross County, if, uh, I think you'll remember that the goalkeeper had an absolute screamer of a game i think they said it was the most mm -hmm. saves made in a single game by a, a, a goalkeeper clearly a um a bit of an anomaly when it comes to the na natural way a game would be expected to play out in that game i remember reading that rangers had i think 20 20 corners and 13 mm -hmm. of them didn't make didn't hit the a, a rangers player first so that screams out to me that there's an inefficiency there and given that we're playing against high-profile teams in Europe where chances will be at a premium, what do we need to do differently? Do we play it short? Do we do we retain possession and look to change the angle to maybe unsettle the defence with a short ball to kind of get them slightly panicking? How, how would you approach it? Just from what you said, we have to do it differently. If we, we, to quote like Blackadder, doing the same thing we did the last 15 times is the last thing or anybody would expect. But we're just, as Tom was saying, we're just chucking it in the box Again, these teams are built on really big back defenders, so they're going to win most of these balls. I noticed the uh, Hearts used a couple of good um, short corners yesterday in the, the game against Celtic. Um, we need to be looking at mixing up. One short corner a game isn't really mixing it up and just throwing it in. And whether it's an in-swinger or an out-swinger, they just seem to be going 
to the same place and it's, it seems to be easy to defend against. So we, we need to do something differently. And uh, just to go back to your point on uh, a coach, was it uh, Coolshaw? Was there a coach? That, Tom Coolshaw was it? Yes, Tom Coolshaw, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, uh, I guess um, reading the comments there that Clement <laughs> says he's responsible for set pieces uh, with his openness to having people like psychiatrists come in to help players. I hope he'd be open to have a set piece specialist come in, you know, maybe not this season now, but uh, some point in the future because um, we've the stats don't lie on that one. We should have scored a lot more, or we should have, we could expect to have scored a lot more than we have done. Yeah. And I think that's exactly the, the mindset that we should be taking. You know, you look at some of the best teams and the best, not just in football even, and you look at some of the highest performing teams and it's these marginal gains, you know, the 1% of different things around the pitch add up to be a huge amount. Well, can so I come in and ask, be... so it just, oh, okay. when you were talking there, it just reminded me of the American football system where they've got set peak coach, um, coaches for yep. the defence and things. We should be looking at stuff like anything to get marginal gains, you know, one or two goals here and there will make a big difference. Uh, special yep. games like the weekend where we could have just done with getting back. Uh, you know, when, when we got the penalty, just getting ahead, that would have made their heads go down. Um, exactly. But they said they get they get a, a they get a, a not a cheap goal, but um, an unmarked player in our box. We didn't have an unmarked player in their box. It's very true, and I think when we're working on such a tight, uh, well, ho hopefully it won't be tight, but but you know, a, 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 an intense title race. These one or two goals can be can be a real deciding factor, and I remember the game against Kilmarnock, and um, I think it was rolled. I think it was the lad uh, Kennedy rolled the ball to Polworth, and then Polworth was whipping these balls in. I think there was one in the first half there, maybe two or three actually in the first half where they whipped it in. Uh, one was at the front post, a couple were, were deeper, and the delivery was fantastic just by changing the angle, you know, and it just kind of unsettled us a bit. So it, it, it's it's definitely, for me personally, Scott, well, look, Scott, tell me what your thoughts are on it, mate. What, how, do we need to employ someone that goes, there is a big problem here in the sense that we're not killing teams off quick enough, we're not taking capitalising on our chances, and a lot of those chances are coming through set pieces? I think Kai's just come in and made a good point about the delivery doesn't matter when your biggest players can't direct the header towards goal. You look at um, Connor Goldson had two or three headers away to kill Marmock, and he had a, a free header against Mullerwell on Saturday. Fair, don't get me wrong, he stayed forward, um, and it was a cross that came in, it wasn't a corner, but still, the the point's still there, that the fact that he's had three free headers at goal, and like one of them's been on target, the conversion rate's awful. The conversion rate's awful. The problem lies for me is that the players, I don't know who's managing the set pieces in the park, but it needs to change. Um, the outswinging corners that we've been doing for countless years now, five years we've been watching these corners. And only in the 55 season did we really see it come to any fruition because we were just, the quality of ball going in, the Joe Aribo is the first man and he was flicking on at the back post, etc. etc. That's when it worked, when we had Tom Coulshaw and mm. um, as my set piece coach. For me, Philippe, Philippe, Philippe Clement has come out and said that he likes set pieces and he wants to work on it at the training ground. I would like to see some of his ideas starting to come to fruition then. I would like to see some short corners, um, some in-swingers. I'd like to see a bit of variety. I don't want to see Ben Davis at a corner ever again <laughs> in my time as a Rangers supporter right enough because I don't know who came up with that decision. It was absolutely wild. Um, but for me... I mean, see, see if you look at it, Rush, you've got guys like Cyril Dessers, big guy, John Lundstrom, big guy, Connor Goldson, John Souter. That's four big bodies you've got. And previously, like, for the start of the season, you had Sam Lammers in amongst all that as well, who's a big unit. And not one of them uses the frame at a corner because the delivery, oh. as Curry's pointed out in one of his comments, half the time it's not getting by the first man. So the delivery, yeah. the, type of, the type of corners we're playing aren't they good enough. It's yeah. as easy as that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I think we need to be. It needs to be relevant to the team you're playing against. So, so look, do, do they do they are they a big team that wants to absorb the ball and and very yeah. confidently can get rid of it, or do they hate having the ball whipped in on the goalkeeper because it's a what happened there? I think we lost. Well, it. Hmm? Scotty, I'll, I'll I'll take that as a um, a sign for this 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 week's question. 
<laughs> <That's fine. laughs> no worries, uh, I hope Ross is all right. Um, yeah, so this week's this week's question, um, with it being no league game, and we're playing uh, Benfica in the Europa League against Portuguese, obviously, opponents. Uh, the question for the people in the comments to have a little go at. Mm -hmm. In Ranger history, we've had six Portuguese players play for us. Can you name those six players? Um, put your answers in the comments and at the end of the video I'll uh, give the answers so uh, yeah six Portuguese players to play for Rangers I tried to answer it to Tom earlier on and it just didn't happen <laughs> I could name two I think I could name two um, I can picture wait. one I just can't think of his name well I got we'll just say two obvious answers are Silva and Mendes yeah, yeah. that's two that's um, two I, I remember who I was thinking of I remember one do you want me to say? No, no. No, no, no. 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 Give, that's give, fine. give people in the comments a chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's fine. <laughs> you all back. You all right, Ross? Sorry, lads. Um, I just had a Put call from... in the meter, yeah. I had uh, just a, a call from unknown number P. Clement. He went, we need you in quickly. I'd, uh, I'll, call <laughs> I'll call him back. Um, but yes, right. So I guess my second point, lads, really uh, just to whiz through this one was now that we've got a couple of weeks where we're not playing uh, SPFL League games, I thought it'd be worth just a very quick whiz round. Who is your highest performer since Christmas? Who is your most underwhelming performer since Christmas? And who is your brightest spark? So you can interpret that how you want. Lads, in the uh, in the comments, it'd be great to, to hear your thoughts. I can see you all answering uh, Tomo's question, which I didn't hear. But um, yeah, if, if you could tell us what your, who your highest performer is and, and briefly why, most underwhelming and why, and the brightest spark. Scotty, I'm going to come to you first, buddy. Right, most underwhelming player. Oh, it's a fight between Nicholas Raskin and several Dessers for me. Um, I've been quite good at criticising Dessers tonight, so I'm probably going to go for Nico Raskin. And my brightest spark. Da, 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 da. That's a hard one, probably. Tom wants. Nice. I would say since the return, my prospect, I'm going to go for Zach Lovely. The obvious answer would probably be Ross McCausland. But I think if Zach Lovely gets a run of games, then you are going to see what a player this boy is, gents. And um, so, so you've answered um, an additional question, which I'm glad you have. But, but who do you think is the highest performer? Highest performer. And you can take that uh, how you want. Exceed in expectations, continue, consistently delivering. You, you, you John Lundstrom. John Lundstrom. It's probably going to be a popular one right now. Yeah, yeah. Tomo, where's your head at with those then, mate? So highest performer, most underwhelming, brightest spark. So we'll start we'll start positively. Brightest spark for me, uh, Ridvan. I think uh, mm. since he's come into the team, I think he has been. I think he's been excellent, and he will only get better. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, he will. He will only get better, and um, I'm glad that the noise about him leaving in January didn't come to anything, because I can see him being a, a mainstay at left back for a number of years. Um, most underwhelming. Uh, oof, there's a couple. There really is, but I think I would have to agree. With Scotty and, and um, Nico Raskin, I just last season I thought him and Cantwell were going to be main players in our team this year, and for whatever it is, Raskin just uh, I just can't see what he brings, what he brings to the team. He doesn't score goals, he doesn't assist, doesn't really seem to defend, and I don't, as I say, he's, he's really underwhelmed this season and for my highest performer it's a toss-up between Lundstrom and Tavernier I would probably go with Lundstrom because I thought he was pretty much on his way down as a Rangers player whereas Tavernier just pulls something out of the bag when you need it um, so I would have to say for my highest performer I think Lundstrom he's, he's been I'd say a bit quiet on Saturday but excellent overall and 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 Tomo, you mentioned Ridvan there. I think a few comments have come up saying 
completely agree with that. I, I, to be honest, it's not even one I'd, I'd really thought about. So, so I'm glad you've raised that. Good to stimulate thought. Do you think that's a strategic play from Clement that we wanted to retain him because he thought there was a player in there? Or do you think it was a case of we've not got the backup? We didn't manage to get Hefte in. Uh, let's just keep the guy on board and, and hope for the best. And he's got a run of games and, and he's he's really stepped up to the play. I think everyone's really impressed with the guy. Yeah, I think his early part with us was really marred with injuries. Anytime he started getting a couple of games in, he'd be injured and out for weeks. Whereas now we're getting to see him with a run of games and Barisic will be gone in the summer. So we need that we need that succession planning. And he's been here now for what, 18 months, I think it is, Red Van. So he's he's he'll be settled in Glasgow, settled with how we play. If we're signing someone, it's going to be a backup for him. I'd be surprised if we go out and spend a lot of money on that position. Interesting. Interesting. Billy, over to you for your, your three, please. So just yeah, uh, um, um, you got it. Uh, I don't want to pick the same the same players, uh, but I was having a wee think. And most underwhelming to me is because of the expectation I had for him, and that's Silver. He's just not quite done what I was hoping um, when you see, I guess it's not his fault what he's sold for in the past, but when you have got a big price tag in your head, you expect a bit more, so he's dis been most underwhelming because I expected so much more from him, and it's not fair because he's only been here what, a month or so So, um, but I yeah. wanted more for him My um, Just on that, Billy I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, It would have been great to have seen Scotty's face when you said that, he was off camera at the time, but I would have loved to have seen the face he was pulling when you said that <laughs> to say it again, like... take two <laughs> no, I, no, I just would have liked to see you. I heard you still watching. Your wings are running in and out. <laughs> you've got Fabio Silva printed on your pajamas. I know that for sure. Uh, Billy, <laughs> on to your next one. <laughs> yeah, and, um, I've got to say the the most improved for me is um, in the recent term anyway is Yelmaz um, because he, he's thankfully he's come in and, and made that place his own. And I, again, I've said several times I see no reason to be playing. Barris is ahead of him anymore. Um, as I said, Barris will be gone probably 99.9% .9 in the summer. So we need to play him, and he's a better player all round. So uh, be between him and Lundstrom, but I would say Lundstrom probably had been playing a bit better before, you know, he, Yelmaz kicked on. Uh, and my, my bright spark is Diamande. Um, I've just been really impressed. But I, I mean, I know he you know, had a great game at the weekend, but the goals he's, he's, he scored from outside the box, he's been. He's been really impressive. Love it. Love it. Ross, um, can I come in really quickly just with yeah, one question for, for three of these? Right. Cortez, rumour is he's out to the end of, he's out to the end of the season. Just a quick yes or no. Um, Ross, do you trigger the, the option to buy him? 100%. Billy? Fits within our play. Sorry, just, just quickly on that. Fits within our player trading model. If we're getting him for the, for the price that's been rumoured. Look, the, the guy has excited us every time he's been on the pitch. It might not be consistent enough, might not be, you know, over a long period of time, but 100%. Bobby? Yeah, I, I'm also yes, but with the caveat that the uh, Clement knows what he's getting with him because obviously we're not going to get to see, um, you know, what we were meant to see, meant to see six months of it or so of him um, in pressing. But I, I still think I still think what we have seen, it's still a yes. Tomo? From what I've seen, definitely, but I think it might come down to what happens with Seema as well. I don't think we'd be able to have both of them, but if I was playing football manager, FIFA, whatever, yeah, she'd be getting signed. <laughs> right, sorry about that, Ross. I was just interested. No, no, no. All good. I, I was going to run through my three very quickly. Um, right. Brightest spark, I was actually going to say Oscar Cortez. I think any time he's been on, he's... Um, He's looked really, really good. I think he's looked very exciting. He's still a very young lad. Um, so so get him six months under his belt. Get him a pre-season under his belt. And I think that there's a very exciting player there. We've never really... Oh, this is going to cause a few comments here, but I was a big Kent fan. I, I, I wasn't podcast at the time, so I couldn't really say it. I was a big Kent fan because he got me out of my seat. Yeah, he, he was lazy and he was annoying. But do you know what? Play, defenders hated playing against him. And I can see a similar fear in his in defenders eyes when Cortez is running at them because he, he just looks like he can com commit defenders so um so I'd say Cortez bright spark uh, most underwhelming I think I'd probably 
have to say, oh, serial Dessas, my boy Dessas, my boy, my boy, my boy. Um, just, like because, just, just <laughs> only because I just think he just fluffs too many. I'm there desperate. It is like I'm watching my son there. I'm like, come on, please, just give us a right, call. See if, right, see if serial Dessas could like <clears throat> touch and shoot. It'd be a brilliant striker. Yeah, that's not yeah, and, and he touch and shoot. The things he, he does sometimes. Him. He does sometimes. He, he does turn and shoot beautifully. I remember the goal against Hibbs when he just laid the naughtiest little shot past the keeper's near side, just dribbled in. The guy was, you know, was on his ass in the net. It was fantastic. But yeah, he just doesn't do it enough. And um, yeah, I worry in those big games with him. I, I do worry. But then again, look, Betis, he, he scored a beauty. So um, yeah, I'm hoping to see him uh, score a belter again in Lisbon. Um, and I guess uh, highest performer. If we signed the guy in the January window or in the summer, we would be raving. And every podcast we have would be spoken about him. It's James Tavernier. The guy is a remarkable footballer and he is consistent. He's just His assists and goals are unbelievable in itself. But to do that as a defender and time and time again, the game against Killy, we probably would have not got the result if he hadn't stepped up and, and, and put that one in. So... Yeah, James Tavernier for me. I, I, I back him. He's, a, he's some player for us. Fair points, mate. Fair points. Right, so, uh, Tom, I'll come to you first. I think this is your lineup on the left hand side, isn't it? We've got. It is, yeah. Um, yeah. This is for Thursday. We've got Butwin, Tavernier, Goldson, Suta, Ridvan, Diamande, Lundstrom, Lawrence, Sterling, Wright, and Silver. I've got one question to ask you about that lineup. Why is Scott Wright in it? Why is Scott Wright? Why Scott Wright? Yeah. Why, why, why Scott Wright? Va- va- valid question. And to answer that, we've got no other wingers. It's, um, you know, obviously after the, the horrible challenge on McCausland at the weekend, don't think he'll be fit for the game. So I think Wright will give us that out ball. Um, I, he's not the answer for me, but he'll give us that little bit of pace up front. I mean, actually, when I submitted the team, I completely forgot about Ryan Jack. You know, I think he could mm-hmm. potentially slot in there somewhere. But European experience. Yeah, yeah, completely. I say he was on the bench on Saturday, but it wouldn't surprise me to see even Jack in there with Diomandi a little bit forward and maybe Lawrence out on the left. But the um, yeah, the right thing was just running out of running out of wingers and you know he, he started European games in the past and. You know, could well be a bit of a bit of a dark horse at Benfica. Don't know much about, but it was a it was a reluctant pick from me. It wasn't someone I was there. Uh, I was raving about. I've got to be honest. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Right, Bally, just going to quickly move on to yours. We'll just do the team sort of predictions and just have a quick uh, chat from the person that's picked the lineup. So, Bally, you've went for a wee bit of interesting information here. Um, you've went for Butland <laughs> Tavernia. Um, Goldson, is that Balligan? Yeah. Balligan and Yelmaz. You went for a midfield three of Diamande, Raskin and Lundstrom. Then you went with Lawrence, Sterling and Silva. Do you want me just to leave just now? Well. Uh, <laughs> See, to be honest with you, <laughs> I, I, meant to, I meant to pick the formation that Tomo's got there. So it's, I, I, I must just not have seen it and I, I went and I just kind of panicked, I think. Um, I also forgot about Jack because I would have had him in over Raskin if, I, if I'd remembered them. I know the names come up, but you just in your mind you've got okay, I'll have of them. But I think we'll probably have two sitting sitting midfielders, um, and I think it'll be a, a very backs to the wall um, type of type of thing again. Sterling plays so well on that side against St Johnson. I'd be hoping for him to be the option of an out ball rather than having to resort to Scott Wright. And I just think Silva up front at the, at the moment, but. Feel free to to criticise. No, no, that's, that's, this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. Um, right, Ross, I think your team's on the left, am I right? The Butlin, Tavernier, Goldson, Suter, Yilmaz, Diamande, Lundstrom, Lawrence, Sterling, Wright and Silva. Have I got oh, wrong? no. Oh, well, no. I put the wrong team up then. So who did you go? Oh, don't yeah, you. I, I went for... Um... So, uh, very similar back four uh, and keeper, Butland, Tavernier, uh, Golson, Suter, Yilmaz. I went for Lundstrom, Diamande and Lawrence. I went Sterling out right. I went Fabio Silva left and I went Dessas. Oh, man, Dessas. 
uh, up top. Um, the reason I did that is because I actually was really impressed with Silva on the left uh, when he started playing there at the at the weekend. I thought he played really, really well. He looked really dangerous cutting in on the right. I thought he showed great energy, great determination, almost like all the stuff he's been doing in a central location, but a little bit more concentrated um, on, on that wing back. And for those that haven't watched the uh, the Benfica Lowdown, which is on the Rangers Journal, uh, an interview I did with um, the guys from the Long Football Podcast. If you haven't seen it, go and check it out now. But they identified to me that some of the wing backs were the real key areas that we could get at them. So I think given that Silva is well known in Portuguese football, a bit of a bright spark and a prospect that came through with Porto, um, they'll be very wary of him. So if we can get him in that area, given that he played well at the weekend and to exploit some of those potential weaknesses, it could be a winner for us. Um, and then and then Dessa's in there just to cause a bit of chaos. We know Otamendi, he got sent off at the weekend. He got sent off when he played against us. He's a bit of a um, uh, headless chicken at times, and I think he can panic a bit. So if you get Dessa's in there, Dessa's will be panicking. He'll be panicking. The whole fucking team will be panicking. So so get him in there. Get them get them going crazy and uh, see what comes out of it. So that would be my strategy. Cause chaos. Fair enough. All right, so um, <laughs> my, my team is... I've went for a 4 3 3. That looks like a wee bit of a wild formation. Um, this is on the We Are the People app, by the way. Everybody should go and download it. I think it's pretty popular anyway. Um, I've went for Butland Tavernier, um, Golden Suter Ridvan, Lundstrom is a six, Diamande and Raskin. Raskin will probably drop in with Lundstrom. I know people in the comments are probably thinking he's sat and slated Raskin for half an hour, but I think he comes in. Um, but I did forget about Ryan Jack. I think you're going to see Lawrence off the left, Scott Wright on the right, and Cyril Dessers up top. If Cyril Dessers can take a touch and finish, I think he's going to be... I think we're going to see the if the best of Cyril Dessers in European football, if I'm being brutally honest, because yep. he can get the time on the ball. Um, I think Lawrence in like a, a free roll, almost in that area of the park, where he played for Derby, would be a good way to utilise him. Um, the midfield three, I'd probably change it to Ryan Jack now. Um, but I just think a wee change of formation is, could be up in my just sleeve him all night. Mm-hmm. Um, right, gents. Thank you for that. So I'll just come around once where you can thank the uh, viewers and the listeners and you can give me your predictions. Ross? Yeah, uh, no worries. I think I think we've got Tomo's uh, trivia uh, answers as well, which I'm That's looking great. forward to. If you could I'll repeat the question again yeah. and give me one second to think about it then i'll come back to you with an answer um no th- thanks everyone for watching um really means a lot that we can see the numbers every time it's getting more and more so please do like share subscribe do all those things it means a lot to us we do put a lot of effort into this so thank you very much uh for, for tuning in i want to say as well jack butland you're a lucky boy tonight we didn't have time to talk about you because we were about to go in uh there would have been a tanned ass this evening for mr butland um <laughs> but my prediction for uh i'm flying out with my dad tomorrow which is going to be a um a really good occasion dean as well from the rangers journals flying out so we're gonna have a bit of a rangers journal uh knees up out there i'm gonna go for two nil rangers uh and i'm gonna say a tavernier penalty and a dessa's uh goal all right ross it was it's six portuguese players to play for rangers you ain't anybody okay. all right i'll come i'll come back to you on it yeah, yeah, uh, right Dally, thanks for coming yeah. on mate and i'll good point think- yeah, thank you for having me on again. I, I love being on it. And also, thank you very much for everyone that's listening and commenting as well uh, to keep it kind of going along. Um, Prediction-wise, I, I would have agreed with you up until I listened to your podcast, Ross, and now I'm terrified. So um, it was a, it was a great podcast. Please, everyone, go and listen to it because it's really informative with, um, how they how they play. Um, I think we will score. Not that it matters where we goals anymore, but I think we, we, we slip out with a, a 2-1 defeat. Fair enough, as long as we're still in a tight. Tomo? Hey, ho- 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 Tomo, ho- hold on just a wee second. Okay. So, Stuart Keane is somebody that we need to try and break because he gets the questions right every <laughs> single trivia. And he's just he's just commented there. So, he's got Mendes, Silva, Capucho, Alves and Candace. And he's just commented there like two seconds ago about Fabio Cardozo. So, somebody needs to come up with a trivia question that's going to catch this guy out. Right? I'm putting that challenge to you guys. Is that Sorry, one that's not on Wikipedia? Because I think we'll probably think of one of them. <laughs> You'll probably need to come up with something in the 1900s or something, mate. <laughs> how, many, how, 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 many, how many bricks we use to build Ibrox? There we go. There we go. Let's see how, let's see how that goes down. 
Uh, um, we just want to thank the listeners and do your goodbyes. Yeah, no, definitely again. Th- thanks again for having me on the podcast. Absolutely love it. Love talking about the Rangers and most importantly, thank you to the people getting involved in the comments, listening, subscribing, sharing this out. You know, we all we all love the Rangers. We all want to see them doing well and hopefully come the end of the season we'll have a, a big party on the podcast about, uh, you know, three or four trophies in the cabinet. Um, my prediction for the game, I'm going to try and be positive and I think we'll, I think it'll be a two-all draw. I think we're going to have to withstand a lot of pressure and be very patient in the game, but I think we will have scoring opportunities and we just need to take them. So, yeah, the answer to the question, um, your man, Mr Keane, got them right, was Pedro Mendes, Daniel Candias, Fabio Cardoza, Fabio Silva, Bruno Alves, and one we probably all wish we could erase from our heads, Nuno Capuccio. Was Dalcio so, not Portuguese? No, he's from, he is from, uh, it's something like Equatorial right. Guinea. Right. I'm, sure, I'm sure I've seen him playing in the African Nation Cup back in January. I'll double check it, but that was the six that came up. All right, well, thank you again for coming on, boys. Um, taking time out of your day to come on and chat about Rangers. It's much appreciated. Ross, have a great time in Lisbon with me, Dean, mate. Mm-hmm. Have a pint for me. Ross, um, well there. Well I, there. I'm going to say that Rangers are going to come back with a 1-0 win. I think Fabio Silva's going over there with a point to prove and he's going to score the winner. Um, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Um, Rangers, we bit complacent in the weekend there, but we've still managed to extend the gap at the top of the league. Take care. <laughs> Thank you.